Um, so I'm, I'm going to start this talk and I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and um, do please feel free to interrupt me at any point you like. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions afterwards. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see that okay. Right. Um, ah. Right, good. Okay, so I'm going to start this talk by way of citing Noam Chomsky's recent observation that we've entered, quote, the most dangerous point in human history. Um, and the basis of this claim is an immediate future of unimaginable climate catastrophe, species extinction, a loss of confidence in civic administration systems across the world, and the renewed threat of nuclear war from the rise of authoritarian regimes. And we might also consider how Chomsky's words intersect with the university as an institution and its own crises of marketization, instrumentalism, graduate debt, and the denigration of arts and humanities subjects, as accelerated in the UK by the government's decision two years ago to cut 50% of funding for arts courses here. And I also note uh, a spate of announcements about job losses um, across the British University, across a whole raft of arts, established arts courses, and a university in the north of England called Sheffield Hallam that made a decision to terminate its English literature degree. So the wider context here is the systematic reconfiguring of education through the 21st century to serve a relentless social Darwinist focus on competitiveness, resource depletion, and individual acquisition. This is, of course, a market ideology accorded natural status, a condition that the late theorist Mark Fisher named capitalist realism, which, and I quote, seamlessly occupies the horizons of the thinkable, having colonized the dreaming life of the population. It's one, it's a system of thinking that's brought us to the point of collapse of the Earth's life support system. Now, when it comes to the parameters of the contemporary university, we could equally well deploy the term managerialist realism, beyond which educated people supposedly can no longer think or function. This is a system marked by an obsession with emulating the audit culture of business, of reporting systems, of inputs and outputs that erode that possibility of the freewheeling encounter that's crucial to the life of the mind and where the instinctual capacities of trust and empathy are rendered obsolete. This is a corporate episteme, of course, which in Britain is the consequence of the, of the government's 2012 funding settlement, which transformed students into financial units and plunged higher education institutions into crippling debt. With the pay levels of our vice chancellors, the people that oversee our units, Regulating, regularly touching £400,000 a year and teaching increasingly casualised, this has become an extraordinary way to run a public service. So within such a system, how can demoralised, overworked, overmanaged teachers be anything more than service providers or dispositifs, Michel Foucault's term for the administrative mechanisms and knowledge structures which underscore the exercise of power within the social body. So in exploring what the viable university might look like in the face of biopolitical emergency, those available models of higher education seem increasingly unserviceable, if not obsolete. And we might therefore consider a parallel shift into alternative forms of education, where agency might be recovered by the individual and the collective alike, and where the principle of conviviality, Ivan Illich's term for the autonomous and creative exchange among people and their environments in the face of industrial demands might be restored. So the task then is one of building the new university or what I like to think of as the para site, meaning to the side, in the shell of the old and thereby equipping students with necessary critical abilities and the creative confidence to make interventions to ensure the perpetuation of life on Earth. 
So the new school of the Anthropocene is one such response, a self-organizing body, um, two years in the making, which has been founded by academics from across the university world, alongside arti artists, practitioners, and people from uh, other forms of engagement, practice, and profession. The new school is a collaboration with the October Gallery in London, which is part of the Institute of Ecotechnics, a research hub dedicated to exploring the relationships between humanity and ecosystems through developing sympathetic forms of technology. This has been manifested over 50 years in a series of spectacular biosphere demonstration projects across the planet. Most notably, Biosphere 2, a vast hermetic glasshouse in Arizona, containing a ratio of the Earth's topographies and climate systems in a microcosm, and in which eight scientists were sealed for two years in an experiment in closed systems living. Two years ago, a very fine film was made of this called Spaceship Earth, which you can find freely on the internet, I think. Another notable project is the research vessel Heraclitus, an 80-foot, three-masted replica, 17th century Chinese junk, cased in ferro-cement, which has sailed over a quarter of a million nautical miles across the world's oceans, collecting coral reef samples and staging theatre workshops. A more recent project is Eden in Iraq, uh, a water remediation experiment, and the 40-year-old Las Casas de la Selva, a rainforest rejuvenation project in Puerto Rico. Now, the October Gallery in London is the Institute's Centre for Urban Ecology, dedicated to intercultural engagement through the arts, with decolonization etched into its practices from the very moment of its opening in 1979. These independent sites and several more are also part of a new initiative called Academia Biosferica, a planetary university that will eventually host on-site educational programs across the five main earth biomes, mountains, oceans, forests, desert grasslands and cities. And we're currently in the process of gaining recognition from UNESCO as a futures literacy lab. <clears throat> As a part participant in this, the new school's aim is to run programs as cheaply and non-bureaucratically as possible. Um, I seem to be having problems moving my slide. I wonder if the host has disabled the slide sharing. Um, Sierra, can you have a look at this, please? <clears throat> ah, we've got, we're back, thank you. Okay. So we want to run programs as cheaply and non-bureaucratically as possible <clears throat> with a pay what you can afford fee policy to release students from the tyranny of debt. So the new school has no governors, no boards of trustees, no managerial tiers. Everyone who works with us is paid the same. And our first cohort of 26 arrived last September uh, to study with us both in person and online. We have people from New York, from Tajikistan, from Niger. Um, we have people joining us from Cairo, Ireland, France, and Scotland, as well as an in-person group in London. And among this cohort are, are, uh, are two refugees <clears throat> from conflicts in Ukraine uh, who study free with us. Now, our primary model is the arts educational community of Black Mountain College which was located in Asheville, North Carolina, in the US between 1933 and 1957. And we think of Black Mountain, we use it not as a geometry of nostalgia, but as a space for the consideration of experiment, as a prompt to action, wherein students are regarded as researchers from the very start, entrusted to discover their own patterns within webs of knowledge through collaborative seminars, and individual supervisions. Our teaching strongly promotes transdisciplinary practices, and we're more concerned with the porosity of subject boundaries than their policing, a principle at one with Ernest Haeckel's 1869 definition of ecology as the study of all those complex interactions referred to by Darwin as the conditions of the struggle for existence. Our curriculum directly addresses the emission of arts disciplines in considering biosphere emergency through fostering a re-examination 
of the cultural narratives and metaphors that shape the human location on Earth. Our point of departure is Felix Guattari's 1989 book, The Three Ecologies, about interacting and interdependent ecologies of mind, society and environment, where meaning is made within and between the spheres. And this, and an equal stress here, is assigned to the creative and the critical act, to individual development and collaborative action, to the body as well as the mind. And this means that more traditional higher educational activities like philosophy, literary criticism, visual culture, film editing, law, economics, have been complemented by the study of permaculture through a local city farm, dance, printmaking, and wild swimming. At the end of their year, students are awarded a diploma in the environmental humanities um, through a creative project that they did that they co-designed themselves. They don't just get a certificate with the imprimatur of an institution. This too is part of their creative initiative. So this diploma is a means of disengaging with the degree awarding bureaucracy. And it's a recognition that personal achievement and growth is not the same as an anxious culture of accreditation, which legitimizes a material and psychological burden of what in the UK has become a regular 60,000 pounds debt to serve as a threshold to adulthood and social participation. Such a context, the new school seeks to explore how, how IRA higher education might prepare students to forge a viable future as, stu as, as stewards for the generations to come, countering that relentless for focus on immediate survival and reproducing the destructive practices of the present, including what the late David Graeber termed bullshit jobs. Now, in September 2021, the Lancet uh, the great British uh, medical research journal published a survey called Young People's Voices on Climate Anxiety, Government, Government Betrayal and Moral Injury, a Global Phenomenon. This study was gleaned from interviews with 10,000 young people under the age of 25 from 10 countries across the world. And it revealed that three quarters agreed with the statement that the future is frightening and 50% reported feeling distressed and anxious about the way climate breakdown is affecting their daily function. In that very same month, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Highlands and Islands in Scotland announced his intention to cull what he called vanity courses in the service of workforce alignment and supply. And in so doing, he exposed a fundamental dualism between that traditional purpose of the university, which is to challenge given forms of knowledge and our contemporary obsession with training and skills, which might prepare office ready graduates to operate administrative procedures efficiently and adapt to the limits of given environment. With the public university therefore, evidently reinvented as a trade school, the question I think we need to ask is how could we genuinely teach for the future and reinstate the adventurous life of the mind as a legitimate value in and of itself. So in the face of this mechanistic customer notion of education, the urgent need is surely to design a curriculum that reflects educational value beyond the enhancement of personal market worth. So how then might we retreat from that notion of education as a set of willed premises to be fulfilled rather than a shared education. So I'd like to go into this a little more deeply before I wrap up. <clears throat> and uh, as a means of addressing these questions, I'd like to say a few words about the nature of the project work that each student, that the, each scholar at the New School carries out. Um, because our experiment in demonetizing and debureaucratizing higher education also extends to matters of pedagogy. So we regard our participants not as students, but as scholars. We think that the word student in Britain has been taxed with university connotations of economic units that receive instruction as access to knowledge, uh, uh, as access to knowledge as a commodity through a monetized transaction. 
So whereas students, I think in Western Europe and in, 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 in America are conceived as conceived of as micro entrepreneurs of the self inside the state of protracted infantilism, the new school's participants are scholars, as in pertaining to a school. We think of them as adventurers, investigators, sharers, both of and within vast cultural webs of possibility. And so we want to really recover the word scholar from its contemporary production within the industrial university as privileged members of a priestly past, jealous guardians of cultural capital. So to us, a scholar is an active producer of meaning. And we regard also all of our participants as researchers. We don't discriminate between undergraduates and postgraduates. A couple of our scholars have got PhDs and hold tenure positions in university. Um, a couple others left school at 16 prior to um, the COVID pan pandemic to participate in and organize the school strikes. So we, we think of our, all of our participants as self-organizing, resilient, and resourceful. Each of them finds his or her own rhythm, pulse, and register inside a collaborative community. And in terms of the work we do, uh, we try and recuperate the word essay from its academic overdetermination as a personal test of conformity. I'm sure you know that the word essay is, a, is originally a French word meaning, it's a verb meaning to essay, to strive, to try out. And this principle underscores the new school projects, which are undertaken individually or as a collaboration alongside a weekly group transdisciplinary seminar and then a further reading group. The word project, again, is very important to us. Originally, of course, that too is a verb, to project, to throw forward an act of risk of investigation. And in this, we explicitly draw upon the American poet Charles Olson's 1950 essay, Projective Verse, which is a primary document for 20th century creative practice with regards to the open four work. Olson was also the second rector of Black Mountain College following Joseph Aldrich. So to Charles Olson, the po a poem's form is never more than an extension of content alone. Form is an active and responsive site, a skin that flexes to accommodate its internal data and its pressures. It is equally attentive to the written cultures of the text and the oral dimensions produced in the body. What Olson called composition by field is the opposite of what he thought of as the closed form of it, where the creative act is merely an execution of a preconceived intention with a given model, such as the sonnet, for instance. To Olson, the poet is a maker, recovering the etymology of the Greek word poem. And we think this applies equally um, to many, many avant-garde actions, especially in America, across disciplines in the mid 20th century. One might think of the, the fictions of Jack Kerouac, the action painting of people like Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Willem de Kooning, uh, the, the free jazz of Ornette Coleman, the dance of Trish Cunningham, of Merce, Cun of, uh, of, sorry, of Trish Brown and Merce Cunningham, the films of Stan Brackett, Jonas Mikas, um, the theater of the performance group, the living theater, the happenings of Jackson Macklow and the installations of people like Caroline Schneemann, Laurie Anderson, and Gordon Matthew Clark. So this is a principle that underscores student work, scholar work at the New School, one that's further articulated by the American poet and rock singer Ed Sanders in his essay, Investigative Poetry from the mid 1970s, that speaks of the poet as a historian, as a vital civic presence working across multiple data fields, archival and freshly produced. Someone who's engaged in an active assemblage of active shaping. And the resulting poem becomes a discharge of energy on the page, a result of dynamic engagement within a field of observation. And this too applies across all the expressive disciplines. So that idea of a project um, is in fact a formal method that emerges from the mid 19th to the early 20th century in, the, in an American tradition of pragmatism in the writing of Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, William James, John Dewey, 
and in particular, uh, William Hurd Kilpatrick, who in a 1919 pamphlet, The Project Method, The Use of the Purposeful Act in the Educative Process, speaks of education not as a coercive pedagogy, but as the pursuit of liberty in the social domain of practical action, of fostering integrated personhood as an essential goal of democracy. So it's a throwing forth of the self into the world. It doesn't regard knowledge as capital within institutionally closed loops of inputs and outputs, aims and objectives. The project method is a way of thinking about how a scholar relates both to and within complex patterns of ecology. Hence our stress on collage from the French term glue, a technology of project. The reason I'm going into this in comparative depth is to just to suggest that the new school is not just an experiment of throwing forward, but it does attempt to recover certain older models, dignified communal collective um, from the past that have been superseded by a paralyzing market ideology. So we, we think of the act of essay writing as being woven into other creative performance modes, such as painting, film, dance, gardening, quilt making, as forms of inquiry. I think someone might actually have their mic on because it's squeaking a bit. If, if you wouldn't mind turning it off just for a few minutes, I'll be wrapping up very soon. Doesn't uh, you? I don't know if you're getting the sound that I am, but I'll, I'll carry on anyway. <laughs> so, Kosh, um, I also have it. Maybe I think the host is having this, a sound. Can you silence? I think someone's got a microphone on. Yes, I can hear like a beep. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like sounds like a mouse has gone into the system. <laughs> oh, I think oh. that's a sparrow in the window. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's very charming yeah. and entirely right for this talk. <laughs> what a lovely intervention. <clears throat> so the idea of the, we, we think of collage as really what, what our students are involved in. And as I say, extends across all forms, dance, gardening, quilt making, filmmaking, painting, writing. The idea of collage is it's a spatial web. It's not a linear narrative. It anticipates perhaps the idea of the digital hypertext, the written work as a portal to many other expressive forms. And the idea too that it accommodates materials from different disciplines and social terrains. And I, there's an illustration here of Picasso's Cubist Collage from 1912, Kurch Fitter's Mertz from 1916, Joseph Cornell's Shadow Box Constructions from, nine, from the 1930s, but as well as the formal uh, academic avant-garde, I think it's also very important that we recover the denigrated craft traditions. And here is Harriet Power's magnificent quilt from 1895 showing that West African mediation of Christian symbols and narratives. So the idea here is that all of these forms are multi-directional, open forms of non-prescriptive joinings, juxtapositions, held in an irresolvable tension that dramatizes um, the, the English poet John Keats's 1817 definition of negative capability as, I quote, as being in mysteries, doubts, uncertainties, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason, as the defining true quality of a work of art. So we, we think of our scholars' projects, and if you're interested on our website, there is a tab called Stories, uh, which has some um, the first few examples of works in progress. We've One of our scholars has just, um, he originally came to us with the idea of making a film documentary about the presence of animals in cities. He, rad he rapidly switched to making a coracle, which he has decided to sail um, through uh, a semi-destroyed East London river called the Roding and film his responses to this. Um, and we put him in touch with an Iraqi artist who as an expert in marsh Arab coracle building, and now he is incorporating um, design qualities from that, that the Iraqi continuum into his own work. So it's just an example of just how open-ended, um, improvised, provisional everyone's project is. They're literally thinking on their feet, and the quality of the work has been, I think, quite humbling. Um, so we, we think of the scholars' projects as places of gathering, of field notes, 
of found and retrieved materials. Um, uh, it, it's what the, uh, the English poet and the essayist Eric Mottram, who's uh, another very important inspirational figure for the new school, he, he called the cultural imagination of synthesis, which I think is consistent with the properties of ecology. And in such a context, we think that the educator's role is removed from that over-determining role of the institution. Our scholars are not charged with, in, uh, our, our teachers are not charged with imparting information, with correcting errors or creating uniform outputs to be managed or ranked. The idea of the project is it's removed from these sophisticated feedback control mechanisms of reporting, of surveillance, of assessment that dominate the contemporary university. We feel no big to standardize and confine it. And we think instead of teaching as an active collaboration and exchange. So the project, therefore, and this is an illustration of a Carolee Schneeman um, intervention from the late 1960s. We, we think of the project as an indefinite adventure towards no fixed goal, a process that is foreign to the category of completion, a permanent, etc., a self-directed act of discovery, organization, and meaning making. So a creation of work without any need for inspection or feedback into a command system. Um, so the, the educator is therefore released from the role of the manager, the systems operative, or even the guru imposing an abstract currency of value. And we feel that the projective act finds its own field without the imposition of institutional anxieties, which are in the service of demonstrative ends, which aren't the scholar's own. And I, I, I speak from experience here. I, I spent about 20 years teaching at Cambridge University. I'm currently teaching at University College London. And, and I think one of the unifying experiences of those 30 years has been a trajectory towards ever greater joylessness and anxiety in student work. So to conclude, um, as we stand before the prospect of the end of life on Earth, I'd like to think that the new school of the Anthropocene embodies that understanding that to be educated is to inhabit a world of forms and impressions that afford a variety of unpredictable responses. The community is a basic instructional force and that the pressing need is to nurture producers, not consumers of meaning. So the new school is not a sentimental bid to reinstate a pre-1990s version of the university but it's an inquiry into how to create small, agile, self-determining higher educational models that are open to collaboration with other organizations. A model that could feasibly be replicated and rolled out reg uh, regionally, if not internationally. So it's therefore to be considered perhaps a supplement to, not a replacement of the higher education mainstream. We're not competing with anyone, but we do want to strip down that commodified package known in Britain as the uni, which is an appalling word, and one that insists that the function of a college is actually to teach scholars. Now this ethos may not be for everyone, but we, are, we absolutely believe that it is for anyone. So in the context of the neoliberal university's ineffectiveness in the face of ecological ruin, the new school is perhaps to be regarded as a counter nihilism gesture, a gathering of people forged in conviviality, companionship and trust, and a means of addressing the greatest intellectual challenge of this, or indeed any era. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be very happy to open this to discussion if, uh, or, or take any questions should any come to mind. Thank you for listening to such a long presentation. I have a question. Andrea, yeah, hi. <laughs> like, <laughs> can I go first? Hello. Go first. Yes, you go first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So nice, so beautiful. I have, so I'll make a comment and a question. Sure. Um, I feel like when first, uh, the first time that I saw the School of the Anthropocene on Instagram, I remember, <laughs> I saw it and I was, this is super interesting. What is it? And then 
like this pending conversation that we have, I was like, oh, I, I so it, I don't know, it's perfect to see it now because I get to know a bit more. And um, I, so I'm in Ecuador and I had this path um, in the university. I was studying, yeah, I did my master. I was doing research. I was teaching in the university. And always for us, like the mainstream, the, um, this idea of, of where the knowledge comes from, comes from England or France, that is like our, our spaces of learning, right? And to see how you are trying to just recap, like what also they, they say, they talk about essays, but how can we revive the spirit of that? It's, I, I feel that refreshing for us because like learnings and new ways of doing education comes from our own territories and i really like what you are doing there because it kind of it, we are just so like our, our ways of education is, is it comes a lot from there so yeah. it helps us if others there are doing that <laughs> so it's like a relief like oh, thank you <laughs> you're taking care of that <laughs> so we can keep like doing our thing here that it's like relation with nature and how we are naming things and so that has a comment and the question is how you got there like a personal question what yep. was, what happened in your path that you said okay here is something that i cannot what like the breaking point that make you because you said you are teaching this university too like you have those two things and and as you say it, it's a compliment but how did you arrive to that i would like to know thank you um yes well i, I suppose i i will have to answer on quite a personal level about this um and and there are three real pressure points, I suppose, that, that came to bear. The, the first was my, my wife and I home educated our two sons, ma mainly my wife, I have to say. Um, and I I wasn't really in favor of it. I, I, I had terrible schooling. I left school at 16 with you know, hardly any qualifications and educated myself as an adult. So I entered the system late. But my wife actually did okay at school. And, um, and I thought it was quite odd that she was determined to do this uh, but it was wonderful and um the home education from the age of about two right the way through to adulthood was was devised in terms of an improvised curriculum you know and this is now possible with the internet you can create enormous gatherings of people you can organize imaginatively and quickly the great parallel curricula and this is what they did you know we created all kinds of um uh drama science educative groups. Um, so it was an extremely social thing. And I, I just felt that actually at this level, education clearly is possible in a self-determined um, autonomous fashion. And why could that not be replicated at adult level? Why could that not actually be, take the role, take, take such a position within the university milieu? Secondly, in, in 2010, there were massive student protests in Britain against the imposition of a new funding and fee regimen. Uh, basically, up until the 1990s, higher education in Britain was had a socialist basis in that it was free. And then it gradually became more financialized. Um, there were charges for tuition fees. There were tuition fees were brought in, grants were removed, and then eventually vast loan schemes came into play. And the students protested about this in the form of occupations. And as a, as a faculty member in the Cambridge English um, department, I, I was extremely inspired by this, and I supported them. I participated in, in a in a you know non interventionist way, but just to to show my um, backing. And the students organised all these informal teachings and seminars, and and I was so inspired by the way they communicated with, with one another with such imagination, creativity, and goodwill. And I thought, well, this could be the basis of a new university. So this has been a long time coming. And then finally, there, there's a very fine, distinguished, and brilliant British writer and academic called Marina Warner. She's a mythographer and a novelist, and really is without question one of the most significant people in the humanities in Britain. And in 2014, she wrote um, a piece in the London Review of Books called Why I Quit. This is freely available online. 
nearly everybody I've spoken to has read this. And, um, and she basically walked out of a professorship at Essex University because of managerialism, um, the financial, uh, financialization, the casualization, the denigration of the life of the mind. And I wrote to her with this, this suggestion and she, you know, I was a complete nobody and she very kindly met me and has been very supportive ever since. And then seven years later, she came and gave a seminar at the new school, which I thought was a rather lovely thing. And she was such an important figure in my thinking and the way this came together. So they're really the three kind of things, I think. But um, I think there's probably one other in that I've been, as I suggested, teaching a long time. And what I would say is that everyone is always angry, is always fed up, is always demoralized within this sector. And things get worse and worse and worse. And the thing about academics is they, we complain, I'm the worst. I'm the world's biggest complainer and moaner. I have to say this. And there is never any sense of what we can actually do about this rather than just complain and moan. And so I thought, I don't want to grow old moaning. I want to try and recover uh, a sense of autonomy. And I want to put what is possible into practice. And, and I've had just such wonderful support from so many people. No one has said to me, this is a ridiculous idea. What the hell are you thinking? And people have approached me to participate. And whoever I've asked to participate has always been very gracious and enthusiastic. So I think from a personal point of view, um, this has been a grace and a pleasure. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled to have enjoyed so much support and collaborative, imaginative, um, participation. Um, thanks. I'll, um, thanks, Michael. So, yes, yeah, so I'm, I don't know what I am a semi academic, but I was a sort of environmental justice person that now finds myself at the University of Cape Town. And, um, so, so yeah, so I entered into the space of environmental humanities and, um, oh yeah, with, and there's a course called Research in the Anthropocene. So I'm curious to, to ask why, why the term the Anthropocene, given its contestation of uh, yeah, the homogenous human, yeah, that's caused the, the, the geological impact of, of climate change. And and I'm also wondering how I, I mean, I entered uh, science and technology studies um, and there, there's a growing concern that, um, you know, while the methodologies are, you know, creative and bringing yep. in the non-human and the arts, um, but it, uh, you know, the decentering of this human where there are many other humans, indigenous humans who have a different relationship to nature and each other, as opposed to the modernist human, um, it's there's a, a a sort of um, I should say you know there's a, a, a it overlooks the the sort of colonial history and the rise of capitalism that emerged in Europe and so you know knowledges of other worlds are sometimes still put in the sort of anthropology box. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, yeah, how you engage with those complexities, you know, and given the contestants and contestation around the concept of the Anthropocene. Here's my Jason Wars book and others. Okay. <laughs> Anthropocene capitalism. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, thanks, Michelle. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, and you, you kind of answered it really with the last cadence when you said that it's such, you used the word contested and that's absolutely right. And the thing is, we're not trying to pin this down or advocate the idea of the Anthropocene as a, a geological uh, a, um, term that precludes human agency. I, I think we're looking at the term in a critical way um, as a theorizing apparatus whereby we can uh, um, take ownership of what humans have done to the planet. I mean, it, 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 you could, we could have a, uh, a very long and detailed discussion about when the, the, the term Anthropocene actually applies to the human career on Earth. But it certainly intensifies, certainly in Western Europe, from the mid 18th century onwards. I, I would argue it's probably, you know, the introduction of the um, 
the first banks appearing in northern Italy at the end of the 14th century, where capital becomes mobile. Another term for the Anthropocene could well be capitalocene. Um, and I know that Bruno Latour in the Seven Planets thinks that you know if you if you trade on this term, then you are you are fundamentally moving into a condition of passivity and refusing political agency. I think there's a fair point there. Um, a rather weak answer is we have to call it something. And um, the idea is that within the range of our inquiries, there there are no limits. And the, but the main thing is is to kind of understand that what humans have done to the organization of, of the material world, you know, that, that we have uh, irrevocably moved it into a, uh, a new space and that the impact of human beings is something that has to be recognized, critiqued and changed. So we think of Anthropocene as a word, it's a problematic term, but as some kind of um, necessary interrogative point upon which we can take responsibility for what we've done and renegotiate the relationships not only between humans, but between humans and the more than human world. And that absolutely includes um, the consequences of imperialism, of, of colonialism. So I, I, I think everything you've said is, is something that we, we think of all of the, about all of the time inside this term. And and one other thing I would add is that the, the collaboration with October Gallery is very important. I mean, it's on several levels. There's, there's, there's no other institution in Britain with which we, I, we, we could have put this together. You know, there, there seems, I, I'm in my 50s now, and I've got a sense that Britain is a pretty nihilistic place. It's dominated by institutions that say no. And the amazing thing about October Gallery is they say, yes, I've known them for around 25 years. I wrote to them about this idea. And within five minutes, it's two most senior people wrote back and said, yes, we must do this immediately. And October Gallery from the very word go from 1979 has been expressly non-Eurocentric, non-Americentric in its coverage of the fine arts. It is always from a, a, a position of cultural integrity engaged with absolute excitement and um, enthusiasm with the arts of Asia, uh, the African continent, the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it is truly planetary in its, in its range of immersions. And that is something that um, um, uh, in, informs the new school's ethos. There's always room for improvement, of course, we know that, but we are actively engaging with um, that, that grotesque um, Eurocentric, um, capitalocentric um, domination of, um, the, uh, of the episteme of, of education. I hope that answers your question, Michelle. It's a good one. And what would you call, if you were doing what, what we've done, what would you call us? What would you want to? What do you think would be better? Because yeah. I, I'm, I'm, ah. I mean, I know about uh, you've got this a wonderful movement at Cape Town University, um, um, Environmental Humanities South. Oh yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, and it has its own contestations. Let me say, because yeah. I have to say, U University of Cape Town's like the last frontier for white people. So yeah. <laughs> And right. yes, <laughs> yes, I, I I was in that unit, but I wouldn't sing its praises. Um, Okay. Um, so, I yeah. So I mean, I I I I hear amongst uh, fellow friends about uh, ontological seeds or seeding in ontological shifts. Or yeah, I you know I I'm really interested in um, asking questions about how we want to be on this earth, and yeah, you know, different ways of being, multi ways of being. Yeah. So so I. Uh, yeah, I think around those kind of, I, I don't have a snazzy cons word, but yeah, there are <laughs> ontological shifts or something, or seeding ontological shifts, the space, a new way of thinking is in that way. Yeah, right. well, that, that's exactly what, what we want to do. I mean, I'm also troubled by the word school. I mean, I've mentioned the, the idea that we don't like the word student because it's burdened with all kinds of commodity assumptions. But, um, you know, scholar still feels to me a bit pompous. You know, but we we want to try and recuperate this term and um, um, render it the property of all. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, these are always going to be problematic. You're never going to settle on anything that, that really does the job. But I, I would emphasize that, you know, we are um, always um, critically vigilant with regard to our language. Um, but I, I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. Can I just say there's someone in um, Jonas who's um, familiar with Black Mountain College in Wales. Yes, I, it's yes. I, I, uh, I, I know about them. Um, we've sent out friendly um supportive communications to them i think it's a, a, a wonderful um experiment very ambitious um it's different to us they're, they're tied very much into the, the um the degree awarding regimen you know that i think they're operating within the, the the more standard undergraduate institutional pathways and i i think there's room for everything you know this is it should not be either or it should be um an and situation here we need alternatives and i'm delighted that they're pulling together such a wonderfully innovative and, and beautiful project we we are a collaborative or we're, we're open to collaborations with anyone we don't think of ourselves as an institution we think of ourselves as more of a purpose or a condition so you know there are no walls for the new school thank you michael can i just ask if renate i'm sorry if i'm pronouncing your name wrong do you want to say something? Yes, very much so. First of all, um, thanks very much, Michael. Really inspiring. And as an academic who is uh, painfully aware, teaching in the UK, painfully aware of these changes. Oh, my God. It, it was a lovely summary. Nice to nice to hear. Um, anyway, so so just from that first point of view already, you know, great. Uh, I really enjoyed it because I thought, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I know. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to live it. Or be lived it forcefully in you know put upon you to know how painful it is and how horrendous it is and also from my point of view i'm very much on your side in terms of i don't want to just sit there and moan it's not going to make anybody happier me neither and also it's not going to help the situation but i find there is you know so i really load your action because i find there's such a lot of inactivity but also we're just so overworked we just don't have time to breathe so so that's the other side of it anyway so i was very very inspired listening to you and actually would love to contribute in some way if i can and if time allows so i'm very happy to i'm i'm sort of in the arts so i mean if, i mean you know so nice um kind of overlaps perhaps and also i have to say i my first degree here we go <laughs> i started more on the creative side in in a, a sort of a a, a, a course which is probably closest to um, free graphics or something it wasn't fine art but it wasn't applied graphics and it had exactly that model project work and we just went off and found out what we needed to do and I'm very grateful this was the starting point of my education maybe if I hadn't had the starting point I wouldn't even have carried on the way I did and things how things evolved and that's how I still kind of operate and it does frustrate sometimes certain colleagues of mine because I, I don't sort of accept all these limits we have between the disciplines because if I want to find out you know I need to find this out I go there I go there and I get what I you know the information I need and I think it sounds like this is the model you're encouraging so I'm I'm saying yeah I remember that and in a sense I need to kind of honor this more that this became foundational for my way of operating within academia as well without realizing um but I also have a question for you which I've written down and I'm trying to find it now but I mean essentially knowing students and having taught for a long time in different countries as well um I mean, the sort of assumption you seem to have is that students, you know, of all stripes or scholars, whichever way you want to call them, um, arrive and they're ready for this self-directed activity. In my experience, they come out of all these systems. They're not ready. They're completely overwhelmed with that proposition and it takes time. And so basically, what do you do to, to help them step into that totally different paradigm which they've probably never encountered different countries have slightly different education systems so in country some countries that's more of a problem than others but being basically terrified I mean I've had students when I just asked them to think for themselves they're so terrified and really don't know you know and they think I'm a really bad teacher because I'm not telling them the solution you know I'm asking no you know tell me what do you think I'm not 
I'm interested in what I think. I mean, I know what I think. I want to hear what you think and or, or how you would approach this or whatever it is. And it's been a huge challenge, which usually takes at least one semester where by the end of it, students sort of lose the sense of terror <laughs> of having to, and that's actually particular to when I was teaching in the US, so I'm really kind of referring to that, um, where they just don't know what's asked of them. So, so basically, how do you unschool or unlearn the 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 way? And I, I mean, you know, I always say kids because well, that's not right. You know, <laughs> they're grown ups. But but you know what I mean. How do you? What do you do to unlearn? Help them step into that paradigm. And also, if people have different cultural backgrounds, as you probably know, Chinese culture. All these uh, people come with wonderfully intelligent people and degrees sometimes two degrees and and they're really not haven't learned to be exploratively creatively investigative people anyway so so that's my question which also uh, tag, tags onto michelle's question um we're sort of assuming a certain kind of model of an individual which is very eurocentric and also not true for us anymore at all because maybe the very very privileged have had that kind of education where they feel they they can sort of take take what they you know approach the world as if they could move within freely anyway so that's my question <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Renata. That, that's um, uh, and thank you very much for such generous comments as well. Um, I'd say this to you and anybody. I'd, I'd be delighted to hear from anyone who'd like to participate on any level. As I say, our, we, our doors and windows are always open to people. We have an ensemble, not a faculty. Of, uh, of I say I'm London based. I'm London based. And I also, yeah, I know, and I, and I know October Gallery. So, so that's oh, well. There you are. You you you're half on board already. <laughs> Okay, okay, carry on. Uh, well, thank, thank you for the, the, the question. It's, for, it's a very interesting one. Um, I think there are several ways to approach this. One that, you know, we, we don't advertise. We haven't got a budget. We, you know, we're a very humble, lean, um, cheap organization, which I think is actually very important because, you know, higher education has become so, as an apparatus, so overburdened with financial complexities, administrative networks. And basically, I do everything. Um, uh, it, it's a community interest company, which um, I co-own with the gallery's director. And the eventual idea is that we turn this over into a cooperative. Um, but that can only happen when um, enough people are ready to commit time and energy and resources. Um, so I, I think that because we, London Review of, of Books very kindly carries the occasional advert for us, but our, our student, our scholars are self-selecting, you know, they have to find us so that we really pull in people who are yearning for something different and, you know, who, who spend some time on the web, looking around, see what's out there, and they find us, so we don't actually go to them, we're not recruiting, people have to come to us. And so in that respect, I think that the people that we we gather in are ready for this. So there isn't really that de-schooling de drive or, or that obligation. Um, and it, it, it's, it's so interesting you, you put that. I haven't really thought about that, actually, because it hasn't been a struggle, and mm -hmm. which, which is a lovely thing to report, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we... We have all ages. We, the age range is, I think, 19 to 68 at the moment. You know, we have a retired Scottish dancer at one end and, as I said, a, a school striker and also a woman who is uh, extraordinarily imaginative and courageous, who's probably about to go to prison because of her role in the, um, the protest against a high-speed rail line two years ago, in which she dug herself into a tunnel for 31 days. Um, so the, the, the caliber of people who come to us are just ready, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think it really sits best for those people in their 30s, 40s, 50s. And I think one of the things we've seen in, in Britain, and I, you know, I'm extraordinarily indebted to continuing education, to adult education, which gave me a second chance, and that it has been quite purposefully and systematically dismantled. Yes, absolutely. By, yes, by, absolutely. by the Conservative and, and the new Labour governments yeah. over the last yeah. um, 30 years. I think this is a disgrace. And, um, and one, and this probably goes back to um, 
Andrea's initial question, what, 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 what are the motives for setting this up? I wanted people to have the same chance that I had when I, I left school with very little coming from a working class background, you know, a, a chance to discover the life of the mind and reinvent myself. And I, I don't think that's available to young people anymore. So it's kind of interesting that the ones who are really, um, who this is, this is really landed for them are probably people in their thirties, forties, fifties. Um, also, I think the fact that, you know, we, we meet in an art gallery. Uh, I think that's important. You know, the milieu is important. That we, We're not in an educational institution. You know, we, 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 we meet in a beautiful book lined room or um, surrounded by paintings or in a courtyard. Or we sometimes meet in a local park, a garden. Um, I, I think, you know, there, there's a poesis of your environment. Um, when, when I was thinking of starting this um, during the COVID pandemic, I noticed a lot of shops had become empty and I thought, well, we, maybe we can occupy a, this before I approach the gallery. Maybe we could occupy a shop. And uh, one of my colleagues said, well, no, not really, because that comes, you know, th there is a poesis of retail. And if you set up in something like this, it won't feel right. Whereas if you're in a space that de that's devoted to the creative act, I think you've got that anyway. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think also two more pivots here. What, one is that, you know, when, when people study with us, they, they, they can pay what they afford, they can afford. So, you know, you can pay as little as 100 pounds. And if you can't afford that, we, we will talk and we will find a way that you, you can study with us free if need be. And our refugees study with us free. And in fact, if you're not in debt, this is very important. You know, debt is, is a, I, I think of debt, debt as a replacement, secular, theological guilt mechanism. You know, uh, it's it, in a, we're in a late Catholic society in the West, and the idea is you're indebted to someone or something. If, that's, if it's not God, it's a bank. Now, if you're no longer in debt to study, you have freedom to think, and it, it, it's no longer so anxiety inducing. So I think that's very, very important. The, 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 the absolute key principle of revolutionizing education is to demonetize it, which I, I think we've been able to do, owing, I have to say, to the generosity of, of a couple of benefactors, you know, because we have no hook into state funding mechanisms whatsoever, and we don't really want them. So we, we, we have, you know, we, we've been very lucky to have some philanthropic support, uh, which has enabled this. And, and then also the idea, I think Renata of, of moving away from education as instrumentalist, you know, that it has to be for a purpose where we believe that the, the function of education is to create critically confident and creatively able human beings. That are, and that's that what are education really... is. What they're doing right now is a, it's a travesty. They've just completely destroyed the spirit of education. Absolutely. 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 I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, at, I'm now at University College London, which was founded in the 1820s by dissenters, um, by non-Anglican Catholics, Jews. Um, it was one of the first universities in this country to give women degrees. You know, this is, a, a, this is not a medieval institution. It's an Enlightenment university that's set up um, with an antagonistic critical relationship to society. And it's the, the, the pressures for conformity, for u utility, for instrumentalism, uh, underscoring its practices and its degree offerings to me is tragic you know I, it's, it's awful um, I so I, I think that idea that you know you're educated for the sake of it yeah and, and that is how it be. that's how it used to be that's still how I remember it actually when I first came yeah. to the UK and just to say um I've also gone through kind of adult education I sort of got to it by education I never thought I'd end up in you know so it's also the sort of pathways which you've gone in as probably yeah to a certain extent at least and um yeah i work in an institution as well social mission but the reality of the administration is exactly what you what you describe it's conformity yeah. is everything even as an academic you're not you're supposed to be critical in your work and, and cutting edge and when it comes as an institutional operator or a colleague you're supposed to be this yes woman yes man and yes woman and and you know exactly how you describe it i just find it unbelievable and yeah and especially <laughs> if you're working in the arts you know yeah. I mean, this is ridiculous yeah it's absurd yeah um, absolutely. yeah no I, I i share your pain <laughs> But I, I think, you know, what no. we've shown, I mean, I make no great claims to what we've done because it's very simple. We, what we've done is given the framework, you know, um, and, and stripped it back 
Um, but we would love to be plagiarized. I would love to see people copy us. I would be delighted to help anyone who wants to do this anywhere else. You know, we've now got a, a body of knowledge that we will can freely transmit. There's no, there's no protection here. There's no jealousy. There's no copyright. You know, I'd, I'd love to see this rolled out elsewhere. Um, it's, it's possible, you know, we can all do it. Uh, Jonas, um, hi, you've, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, I was, my, my question is a little bit, um, I, I think it's really great what you're doing. And I ask myself how these, these sort of ideas can be scaled, especially in contexts that are not as, uh, or more like in the global south or something like that. And um, also addressing the um, issue of, uh, accredit, uh, accreditation and um, as it seems it's a huge huge barrier like to it, it you would probably have to compromise a lot if you would want to turn this um, this program into a master or something like that so my question was is there any way to create like an alternative accreditation system that is not made out of bachelors and masters but is still somewhat recognized and um, is has certain criteria it's a very vague question but i'm curious to hear it, 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 it you know it's a really good question jonas and it's one that's been on my mind for years and and i've got to say that we're, we're currently speaking to um a couple of institutions one, one of which is the global center for advanced studies which i only discovered quite recently but that that does give um, degrees, but does so in a way that's non-compromising. And we do understand that for younger people in particular, you know, that you're so deeply um, trained into a culture that demands um, accreditation. And the, the idea of just getting a diploma, I mean, you know, you could set something up tomorrow um, and give a diploma. It doesn't mean anything. So we, we're giving this as a kind of token nod to that an acknowledgement that, that you know, people are nervous about studying for the sake of study. And, and we are thinking about, well, if we do want to scale this up a little bit more, um, we might need to consider um, giving a master's. And we're exploring how to do that without compromise. So we're also taught the, the Central University of Europe, George Soros's university are uh, quite interested in what we're doing and, and, and interested in the collaboration. So, you know, this is very much a work in progress. Um, but I, I would say that um, the absolutely vital thing is that it remains small and that rather than scale it up into some impersonal, vast, undifferentiated, un, un, undifferentiated group of a mass of students, um, you, you've got to keep it intimate, convivial. And, you know, the, the one thing I perhaps learned from Cambridge University is that, you know, I, I would never say that the, the lecturers are better off than any other university, but I would say that the teaching scheme, which is small group supervisions, you know, undergraduate and postgraduate level, often one to one, is the way that people really move. It's the way that people really gain confidence. And if you're just sitting in a lecture hall of eighty to two hundred people, you, you're you're lost. You're anonymous. You go missing. And so that that idea of you know looking after each other, of working in a companionable and convivial way can really only be accomplished on a small group level. So rather than expand one institution, I'd like to see more institutions. You know, I think that that is the way to do this and that we work together in a sisterly fashion um, across nations, across planets, and that we create alliances. And that, that, that's the idea of the Biosphere Academy, is that uh, Biospherica Academy, is that, you know, our, student, our scholars might perhaps move to working on, um, the rainforest rejuvenation project in Puerto Rico. Uh, we've 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 got um, we're in alliance with some people who bought a place in Perugia with an olive grove that needs restoring, and there's an idea of creating some kind of forest school out there as well. That once people finish working with us, then they move elsewhere, and that there's an interchange. So I think it really has to be small scale for it, for it to work. Otherwise, you just end up reiterating and reproducing those same sclerotic um, impersonal hierarchies that characterize the entire mainstream of the university system.
Thank you, Michael, very much. Thanks a lot. Does anybody has any uh, uh, other questions? We can go on for four more minutes, if that's okay. Are we good? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. And I hope you enjoyed the other sessions. Maybe and one question. You. Um, Michael, I mean, I guess it's easy to find you on UCL website. I'll just drop you a line. Or... Oh, you can you can write, uh, go to the um, the new school website. I'll, I'll just right now put the um, website address in, in the chat. Oh, Sorry. yeah, no, I, I got the website address. So basically look there and, and drop you. There's a way of con making contact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And no, I'm always very happy to hear from people. Um, Sorry, that's badly typed, but you can get it from there. The contact details yeah. are there and um, okay. the email address. Okay, great. Yeah, I'd be really happy, really happy to hear from you or anyone. Um, but we're recruiting for next year. We, we um, this is probably a response to Jonas's uh, uh, question, but we, we, we can scale up to 40 next year. So if you know anybody who'd be interested in joining us, we'd love to hear from them. Um, and I'd love to hear from anyone here as well. Um, with the possibility of collaboration as i say yeah we, we're open to anything so thank you all so much for listening to my very long presentation um and thank you for the questions pleasure thank you thank you very much it was wonderful thank you everyone thank you. for showing up okay i'm going to end it okay bye bye thanks for hosting Yes, thank you. Bye-bye, Adam. Thank you. Bye-bye, Adam. Bye. -bye,